Hello, everyone. I'm Yuta Nakajima, Senior Director at Hauser & Worth in New York. Thank you for joining us to celebrate our exhibition, Jack Witten, I Am the Object, which is on view at our new location in Chelsea at 542 West 22nd Street until this Saturday, January 23rd. We hope that you'll make a reservation online to come and see the exhibit before it closes. Uh, we're thrilled to welcome poet and scholar Fred Moten, along with Associate Curator of Exhibitions at the Studio Museum in Harlem, Legacy Russell. Uh, before handing off to them, for those of you who are unable to attend the exhibit in person, we have prepared this video walkthrough of the show. So maybe Fred, as, as we walk through, since it seems that there's no sound, um, we can be the sound. Um, and I just wanna um, note as we're getting started, just how honored I am to be here today uh, to talk about Jack Witten, especially with you, uh, you know, mutually honored. And of course, to kind of consider what it means, um, you know, to quote Witten, how art can be our compass to the cosmos. Um, I brought with me a little bit of biographical information about Jack Witten for those who are new friends to his work, although I know there are many folks who are uh, deeply uh, followers and admirers of his work, longtime friends, but a little bit about Jack Witten, born in 1939 in Bessemer, Alabama. In 1960, he moves to New York and leaves the Tuskegee Institute, and in 1964, graduated from Cooper Union. Um, in 1974, he had his show at the Whitney Museum, and then in 1983, had a tenure retrospective at the Student Museum in Harlem, um, which you know resulted in an incredible publication. Uh, for those of you who are lucky to own a copy, it's very special with essays from, uh, you know, Kelly Jones and Mary Schmidt Campbell. Um, and then in 2018, I had the privilege of being able to spend some time uh, with his work yet again uh, in Odyssey, um, the Jack Whitten sculpture exhibition that took us from 1963 to 2016 at the Met Museum. So, you know, I, all of this is to say that there's been this incredible career of this individual and, um, you you know, to be here in this moment now, thinking through the lens of this question of the woodshed, it feels like a really apt place to start, um, maybe an intimate place to kind of be considering what it means um, to be in the woodshed. Well, I'm glad to see if we can get in the woodshed together. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're in it. <laughs> honor for me to be here and able to to talk about Mr. Witten's work, and it's especially gratifying to be able to talk with you. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess my own acquaintance with his work is relatively new, relatively recent, um, and I, I, I came to know, you know, more about his work and to really be, um, you know to begin to be deeply invested in it um, because of my friendship with another, with a friend of uh, Mr. Witten's, um, Greg Borderwitz. Um, and I've talked with Greg a lot about, about Witten's work um, and learned a lot about Witten's work from him and then subsequently from, from reading, you know, really beautiful and insightful criticism by the folks you mentioned, Kelly Jones and Mary Schmidt Campbell um, Guthrie Ramsey, mm. um, mm. Henry Geldzahler, um, there, there's a, there's a beautiful wealth of, of, of sensitive work, um, that, that I think has been touched by, by him and, and touched by the way he touches the canvas. And that there's maybe, maybe one of the things that we could, could really talk about today, um, because I believe that it actually does have deep cosmological implications is, is with its touch. Yeah, um, me too. Uh, yeah. I love the the um the woodshed as a meeting place that perhaps we, you know, are in that space even now. And I know that we've intimately been in that woodshed as we prepared for being in this space here. Um, and for those again, who are kind of new to the term, um, the definition of woodshed comes from the world of jazz. Um, to go to the woodshed or uh, to woodshed means to kind of practice in private, which gives room for different types of experimentation, but also um, Fred, of course, right? Suggests a space where real and rigorous work can be possible, where rehearsal 
and kind of, um, you know, radical vision away from, uh, you know, a particular type of gaze um, is uh, sort of embedded and, you know, how that can happen before it enters into a public realm. And so, you know, I've thought a lot about this question of the woodshed, given that, you know, we have intimately now had time with this sort of incredible publication of Jack Whitten's journals, right? Um, and that we're entering into this conversation um, with the great honor and privilege of having been able to spend time intimately with his discussions and kind of perspectives of the world, but maybe as well things that we weren't supposed to see. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very complicated, thing a, a difficult maybe sort of ethical position to be put in as a as a student of Witten's and as a mm. fan of Witten's and as someone who you know as people who are always hungry for more particularly in the wake of his passing where you know that the more that you're going to get is somehow limited you know it's 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 it's, it's not infinite you know mm. there's not this infinite horizon of more and more work and so to get notes from the woodshed is uh, this tremendous gift at the same time as you don't know in a certain kind of way if it was a gift that was meant for you or if it was a gift that was meant to be to be given. Totally. At the same time, when I think about the woodshed, I, I guess I really think about the most sort of, or at least for me, the most most memorable and resonant instance of, of a musician, of a jazz musician going to the woodshed is, is the famous sabbatical that Sonny Rollins took um, when he sort of stopped playing in clubs in the early 60s and would practice at night on the Williamsburg Bridge. Um, and I think that there's something really deep and interesting about this public woodshedding. Um, what it means to, to have to practice in public, what it means to have to grow and engage in a sort of meditative and even monastic practice when, when everyone's there, when, every, when anyone can listen. Um, mm. And what it means is that the, the space of the woodshed is maybe a space of a kind of open secrecy, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I love and that of idea. Course, yeah, to the extent that we're talking about black folks, you know, and we're talking about this horrific interdiction on the very possibility of privacy mm. for for us. You know, maybe that open secrecy, secrecy, or that public woodshedding is is the general mode that, that we've all you know been engaged in. Yeah, I mean, I think this idea of kind of being hidden in plain sight is one that is deeply meaningful in the context of talking about this work. I mean, even as we um, were able to peek into the gallery and spend time with some of the work, obviously an initial entry point was coming into the awareness that the work actually was stored in his studio, kind of rolled up and tucked away, right? That these were things that were these monuments that actually um, are being shown, uh, many of which for the first time. And so, you know, I've been reflecting a lot about um, this in, in intersection with the work of um, one of my uh, favorite humans, Andre Brock, um, who wrote an incredible book called Distributed Blackness. But I think about um, this idea as you're presenting it, right, of kind of rehearsing in public the private spaces that exist within uh, the public eye and, you know, what comes with that um, alongside of Andre's term uh, kind of as an enclaved counter public what it means to exist in that third space and how that third space maybe is uniquely black um, because you know these questions of privacy and, and sort of the public um, have always been things that blackness has to negotiate. Negotiate or, or obliterate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Obliterate into the cosmos, right? And I think it's like interesting too because you know thinking about the notion of legibility there that you know the idea that something can exist in plain sight but perhaps only be readable or you know to a specific group of folks right um that the intention behind that um allows for a certain level of opacity which is you know really exciting um and sticky um and you know really imaginative uh, and that you know within Witten's work there is this kind of complex undoing of what he calls this binary of abstraction this idea that you know abstraction equals object set against representation which equals subject and that kind of unlearning that 
becomes part of this process of allowing these works to be deeply encrypted. And then, you know, us to do the work of kind of having to, you know, look into them, to travel through them as, as kind of this incredible outer space. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, at one point, um, I had begun to think that, you know, first of all, to say that, um, to say that Witten is a black painter and a black artist, to, to speak about him in a way as having been engaged in a job that, <laughs> that white folks didn't think he was supposed to do, which mm -hmm. is something he says in it. It's a great long uh, interview that they did with him at the Smithsonian Institute. But to, to think of him and to consider him as a black painter um, is also necessarily to consider him as, as in a sense, a Mediterranean painter. Um, mm -hmm. and, and as part of this sort of larger Black Mediterranean <laughs> sort of complex of thought and of, uh, and of artistic production, you know, partly obviously because of his time in Crete. Um, but also, I, I guess I was thinking about, in a lot of ways, I was thinking the idea of those, of those beautiful pieces that are in the show, having been rolled up, made me think of them as scrolls. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. um, something like, you know, maybe Witten's version of the, the Dead Sea Scrolls, you know. Right, that, or to use your word monastic, they're like monastic texts, right? And, and yeah. like spending time with them, I think the repetition within them, right? Obviously there's a sonic capacity to that, right? Which is almost like reads like a score. But then there yeah. also is this thing Fred, that I just love, you know, in terms of the, the the reading of it, the way that we look at it, which is that there are beats within it and there are yeah. breaks within it, right? It's within our view and vision and the way in which we're able to kind of digest and take on these pieces. And so that in itself becomes a really complex way of sitting with these works. It encourages a certain kind of silence. Yeah, and when you think about it in terms of, you know, the, the notion of distributed blackness and the, the, the sort of digital, you know, cybernetic sort of implications there. Mm -hmm. It makes mm -hmm. you think of, you know, an, another great Mediterranean, you know, intellectual innovation from, you know, a thousand years ago, but the, the algorithm, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and it kind of reminds me of something that my friend Stefan O'Harney writes about and thinks about a lot. Um, the notion of an algorithm, <laughs> you know, yeah, that there's right. the, the, the rhythmic nature of the algorithm or the, 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 the insurgent, you know, alternative rhythm, you know, in a sort of Caribbean sense, you know, or Jamaican mm -hmm. sense of that term, that's also at play in this work, you know, because of its, the tessellation, the beat, the, you know, you could even say, you know, uh, to quote another great critic, the, the glitchiness, you know, of, of his work. Um, Definitely uh, glitchiness. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's like, you know, this idea of the algorithm I deeply appreciate and as well the rhythm within algorithm because, you know, this idea of the meeting place as being this woodshed and that in the woodshed there is the kind of production of the code, these scrolls these things that, you know, exist as kind of text, but also monuments and have this complicated relationship. And, you know, that Witten's time in Crete embeds him deeply within the classics, right? So there's like a heightened level of awareness of context around his work, of art history around his work. And part of the thing that really cracked me up actually, as I was reading through um, notes from a woodshed was that he was very much aware of his position in art history. Like dude just knew, he knew that there was, you know, something that he was working towards. Um, and it was this kind of amazing thing to see these notes where, you know, he really is kind of mapping out for us in this kind of incredible, exponential, fractal, rhizomatic way, his road towards some of that, right? Reaching towards a certain art historical greatness, reaching um, kind of through and beyond his definitions or the world's definitions of blackness and what um, limitations there are, right? And he just mm -hmm. breaks that all open. So it's this amazing thing to see. And he does it with a sense of humor, which I really, you know, I, I adore. Um, because his voice is really in that. And you see that too, you know, the way in which he's towing the line between kind of critique and memory 
and at points bringing in, you know, color within that, right? It's not something that operates, you know, as a static subject. It's dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. No, the 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 classicism is interesting too. There, yeah, there's a this Afro-Hellenic thing going mm -hmm. on, you know, and it it actually very much kind of put me in mind of the work of really great, important scholar um, and classicist, Emily Greenwood, who, who writes about Afro-classicism. She writes about the, the influence and the importance, but also the, the, the transformative work that, you know, that, that well, particularly Caribbean, Afro-Caribbean writers did in, 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 in sort of transforming the, the legacy of the classics that were you know, maybe impose upon them as a function of colonial education. I mean, the most famous is, you know, is 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 Derek Walcott. You mm -hmm. know, great sort of reconstituted epic poem, Omeros. And and I kept thinking about Walcott a lot. You know, in relation to, in relation to Witten, and partly too because um, what you get is this this whole other kind of you think about Walcott or think about somebody like Kamal Brathwaite and then mm. you, you know, or, you know, Aubrey Williams, you think about, you know, what it, what it would mean to, to think about Witten as part of this more general sort of Afro-diasporic, multi-generic, multi-disciplinary insurgency against you know, within, but also against the history of art, but as well the history of painting, uh, the history of 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 of, of poetry. Mm. You know, those those notes, man, they're so cool. Cause uh, yeah, he's definitely just as you say, completely understands himself within the history of painting in this very detailed, very very knowledgeable and erudite way. And he also understands himself as bringing as trying to bring the history of painting to an end. <laughs> you know, right? And he says yeah. Which I love, right? And I think like, you know, I, I appreciate that you bring up Walcott because, you know, I also recognize that there's something that's, you know, deeply diasporic about the work, how it travels and journeys, but also there is something too that's embedded and entrenched in this question of America. And so, yeah. you know, that he's kind of tangled up in that, but also as well, like really looking to get free and, and giving us the language to find a way towards a certain type of emancipation, right? And that comes through his pushing through technique, right? Like this kind of explosion that takes place on his canvas and even just using like, you know, this the kind of technique of the tesserae, which has such a tradition to it, right? It brings in Byzantium, it brings in like deep, deep art history um, and, you know, the royals of that, right? Which I think is really kind of um, incredible to think through what it means to situate um, some of the questions he's asking into that history. And then, you know, also thinking about the, the kind of texts within it, you know, I, I was thinking about the souls of black folks, right, which is like thinking very much about W.E.B. Du Bois and the work of that, you know, the questions being asked towards navigating a certain type of um, space of language um, of kind of an American site that allows for both a reconciliation with questions of a kind of black presence um, in intersection with, you know, really a kind of toxic American whiteness, right? And the kind of histories there, but then also too, trying to do the work of something different, right? Allowing that to be something that is not, you know, situated and entrenched in that, um, that ends a possibility of life, right? But rather that, you know, it celebrates it and extends it and allows it to kind of take on different forms. Well, it's definitely, it's situated, you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's, it's um, I'm, I have been interested in the fact that, I mean, a couple, couple weeks ago, I did this uh, similar convocation today, talking with Courtney Martin about, um, about, uh, about Sam Gilliam's work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it just struck me as this amazing thing that that Sam Gilliam and, and, and Arthur Jaffa were both born in Tupelo, Mississippi, um, mm -hmm. which heretofore had been most famous for being, you know, the birthplace of Elvis Presley, you know, which is a whole other thing. And of course, when I think about Bessemer, Alabama, I think about the amazing people who came from 
that area in and around Birmingham, Alabama. Um, right. So Angela Davis on the one hand, the, the great literary critic Deborah McDowell, who writes really beautifully about growing up in Bessemer in a, in a great book called, um, oh man, I'm gonna mess up the name, but I, I wanna say it's called Remembering Pipe Shop mm -hmm. because Pipe Shop was a very specific neighborhood in, in Bessemer, Alabama. See, Bessemer, Alabama had a huge, huge steel works there. You know, Birmingham is an industrial town. It's a steel town. Right. Um, and then, of course, you know, when Sun Ra first landed, you know, in, a, in, a, in on, on the planet, it was in Birmingham, Alabama, which he famously asked us to remember as, has a nickname, the Magic City. You know? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then, of course, Thornton Dial, you know, lived for so long in, in Bessemer, Alabama. So it makes me think, man, it, it, maybe Bessemer was the other end, you know, of this great sort of cosmic wormhole, you know, which is like, you know, the sort of a privileged spot where people, you know, where these black folks whose origins are in another galaxy, they kind of came through Birmingham, you know, in order to, you know, to 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 spread the the gospel, so to speak, of what they were doing. And yeah. um, but but it it and it's situated, it it bears the mark of that specific history, which is a history of beauty and a history of brutality. But at the same time, you know. It's um, it's another thing, right? It's like, what if we thought about Alabama as just the Northern Caribbean, you know, mm -hmm. in the same way that we think of New Orleans that way sometimes, or if we, you know, when we think about Zora Neale Hurston, we can think about her as a Caribbean, you know, you know, author. I guess what I'm trying to say is that, you know, the, the Americanness, if they're, you know, of of somebody like Whitten is an anti-national international thing. Yes, you know? um, yes. I'm just and repeating what is, you is, said. Is, is like kind of trying to trouble that, right? Those boundaries yeah. there. And I, I appreciate that wormhole because the wormhole towards this space of industry and, you know, of a technical space of a certain kind of, um, kind of technical training too, at, you know, goes back to Witten's root. You know, he was trained in this pre-med space and actually had to figure out a, a way to, you know, navigate to New York City to get to Cooper Union to begin his career as an artist, but that he maintained this real commitment to the science of the work that thinking yeah. about, you know, the kind of technical uh, root of that as a material, thinking about, you know, quite literally, like as he was grappling with the questions of, you know, how do you make this material work? What are the things that are successes and failures within that, right? Um, you know, what is the life and death of a canvas? There yeah. are these like really amazing moments of kind of trying to push this into kind of a multidimensional interstellar place. And yeah. I, I love that because it makes me, you know, very much aware that his kind of interest in, in the kind of data and technology of this work. I, you know, as I think about this route as you're putting forward, um, you know, seems to be the thing where the technical lives so deeply within this creative training and where he brings in very much so a certain history of a black America into mm -hmm. center four of this art historical narrative, right? Allowing for those things to be possible and perhaps as well to be um, uh, negotiated differently through the lens of race and class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it it places a you know it's a it's a you know I mean I guess you could say it's a burden in the sense that it's a it's a heavy deep responsibility that that he has to take up as an artist and it's a responsibility again both to the history of the of the of the media and the genre in which you work and it's also um, but it's also a recognition that the ultimate fulfillment of that responsibility to that history is to bring that history to a close, right. Right? to bring it to an end. Um, and what it means is that maybe you just can't, that, that, that the ordinary definitions don't apply and that you have to kind of constantly be finding your way, as you say, through, through, through the material and through a, a different, so to speak, relation to the material, although Maybe relation is not even the right word. When you look at the details of of this totem, you know that we're looking at now, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and what you see, what it makes me want is, you know, it 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 
you see how clearly it is the case that he is refusing the comforts of the simple opposition between painter and, and sculptor. And that because he refuses those comforts, he seems also to be refusing those those names. And mm -hmm. and and it makes me want to what I really makes me want to do is to, to call him a fabricator. Um, not a pain. I think I, I feel like he might appreciate, honestly, because like part of you know the thing that was also really neat to read more about his work and spend time with it is that he was deeply committed to the fabrication of it, and as well this idea of kind of um, the machine of it. Like you know, he yeah. would talk about technological imaging and was deeply invested in trying to understand like how do you make an image. Quite literally, what does that even do? Is it even possible to do that? And kind of the taking apart of that, there is where the industry is. There's something there that's incredibly tactile. The artist's hand is always in it. But I agree with you so much that, you know, there is something there that is uh, shucking these different titles and as well forcing us to recognize a sort of different type of dimensionality. Yeah, no, that, I think dimensionality is key. You know, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think he's a, I wouldn't want to say that he's, and again, this is something that I think links him to 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 Gilliam and, and to, to to other artists too, you know, in over the last fifty years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but but what if it's something that, for various historical reasons, is a particular, both burden and chance for black artists, mm -hmm. which is that he he's he's a deep 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 investigator of two dimensionality. <laughs> um, and, you know, that there's a kind of, you know, commonplace set of art historical formulations that emerge, you know, out of the, the criticism and the history, particularly done by, by Greenberg and, and his circle that, you know, that wants to maintain a commitment to a certain notion of painting, but in order to do so, you know, valorizes, if not fetishizes, the, what is called the flatness, you know, mm -hmm. of, of the of the plane, um, and you know what I think, what you get, I think, in Witten, really, really richly and intensely, um, is a kind of thing where he's just like, well, let's investigate what flatness means. Let's get so close. Let's get so haptically caught up in the flatness that we begin to see its contours. Mm -hmm. That we to see its depths, that mm. we begin to see the irregularities and the, the topography of its surfaces. And, and, that's what, and that's what his practice both, you know, that his practice not only calls it to our attention, but it imposes it upon us. And he makes these works that we can, that we can, it feels sometimes like you can walk up in them, you know. Mm. I, that, that, exactly that is the articulation of my experience when I stand in front of one of these works. The idea of being able to walk through the streets of them almost, yeah. that there is something yeah. there. And as well, that I think that if you're talking about like Greenberg, right, that there's a space that cannot be reached by anything other than who is, you know, kind of willing to do the work of getting into them, right? And so there's a real um, kind of uh, refusal of, of criticism because the critique will always be something that that you know can reach a certain point but can't go all the way around, and that yeah. for me I, I found to be you know this really decadent and amazing place to exist within, in that obviously you know as I'm standing in this moment right that I'm seeing very much so that these are uh, streets that we can kind of navigate collectively. Yeah. This is my sweet dog. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's like it's like a topographical map. Um, exactly, exactly that. Of, of a topographical map of the wreck, <laughs> you know. Um, I guess I mean the the Benjaminian wreck, you know, the the wreck of our of our history. Um, and and insofar as he allows us to look back on that wreck, he he calls upon us, you know, to improvise with him. You know, and um, and he's engaged in this work of of improvisation of of, which is also a work of accompaniment. You know, and 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 when you, and again, it's not 
it, it just refuses that simple opposition between representation and abstraction, because what's at stake is not a representation of Kenny Dorham, the great trumpeter, or Train, you know, or, you know, not, not a representation of, of Milt Jackson, you know, in those, those paintings, but he's, he's accompanying them. He's, he's playing with them. He's sitting in. Um, and by the same token, they're, they're accompanying him too. Um, and, and as we view these paintings, um, and as we view the way in which they're not simply paintings, and as we deal with the fact that they're not being simply paintings means that we don't simply view them, we, we play with them, we, we engage them, we accompany them. And uh, it's, it's a, it, what it creates is a totally different kind of set of ethical arrangements that, that obviously have aesthetic implications, but they have social implications too. Absolutely. I mean, I think that the the question of presence here um, and presence, you know, in terms of the sort of directionality of the work, this idea of mapping um, the kind of uh, sort of space that it occupies in, in that, you know, we are able to see almost all of it, but there always will be a space that is uniquely written, that is basically this private space that is held within the public is something that I think is like, you know, it's what makes these works ones that you can keep coming back to. And, you know, I, I'm thinking about, like you mentioned the totems, right? But we've got, of course, you know, across this, the language of a kind of art historical reference, right? Of totems and masks that of course goes through the, the kind of um, histories too of bringing in this sort of Hellenistic blackness, right? Um, yeah. But then as well, the, the kind of um, other language of the work, which is, you know, the crosses, the memory sites, the altar pieces. Yeah. So yeah. there is this deep sense too of um, both remembrance and also of mourning really, right, which I think is something that I found to be really remarkable that, you know, he allows those things to kind of occupy the same space and to do so in a way that is really generous. Yeah, I, it, it makes you, yeah, I mean, I feel like, you know, I mean, what I want to say, and then I immediately don't want to say it, is that he's a religious artist. Um, right. I mean, but you it, mentioned, as we were chatting, you mentioned some of this kind of religious painting, which came up. Yeah. Well, it's a, maybe the better word would be devotional. Um, you know, because, because maybe, you know, in terms of what, what he's reading and what, you know, devotional in that same way that we could talk about Coltrane, let's say. Um, where, or, you know, maybe, 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 maybe the other word would be, would be spiritual, you know, it's just that it's a, it's a spirituality, which is so fundamentally and deeply material, um, or maybe a better way to put it even would be that it's, it's a physical spirituality, you know, um, like, like, um, it's a tactile spirituality. Um, it's a, it's a spirituality of touch. Um, and, but, but as you say, it, it's, it's, it's in its devotional quality. It's also, maybe this is always a kind of work of, of mourning, you know, um, but in both senses of the, of that, of that word, you know, or both spellings, mourning as in, as in, you know, how we remember and how we carry with us what is lost. Right. Right. But also mourning as in, you know, the next day, what's coming next. The dawn. Know? Yeah. And it's, it's um, so these beautiful elegiac works that, um, that, that, that consider the, the death, the loss of, of Ron Brown, of Milt Jackson, of, of, of Isaac Rabin, you know, um, of his teachers, you know, of Amadou Diallo. Of right? Amadou Diallo. Mm. Yeah. You know, that that's man, I kept, you know, the altarpiece. You know, um, that's definitely that's 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 maybe maybe there's a there's a piece that's not in this 
Well, it is in the show. There was a piece where it felt like he had layered the paint over um, over a cross. Right. Okay? As and so the cross is situated as a kind of frame or as a as a as a as a scaffolding of, mm -hmm. of upon which the work is laid. But it's as if that cross is bearing the weight of the art, you know, in a way. You know, and you think, well, what what is the why is art this cross is why is art what you know that the cross is being why is it that art is what the cross is being made to bear, you know? Right. And the scaffolding the itself. Bearing. It is like a, it's an architectural proposition, right? Yeah. That, you know, if yeah. we're thinking about that, the, the way in which these works are, are um, viewed completely, right? Is that, you know, there is an aerial component to it. There's a sonic component to it. There's a spatial yeah. component to it that, you know, within that is this scaffolding. I so agree with you, you know, and as well, the, the um, challenge that comes with that, like thinking about, you know, who is doing what kind of building. And yeah. the ways in which that, you know, for example, an altarpiece can do important work in allowing for a different type of memory and a different type of documentation of archiving, right? Which I think yeah. too is, you know, really um, necessary when viewing these works because, you know, the material is vast. This is like not for the faint of heart, right? To create these works is a meditative practice to go back to, you know, where we began, but also as well, a kind of there's a there's a ritual folded into them, right? And yeah. and as well, a sort of keeping, which I appreciate, right? Because to kind of have these different pieces, these tesserae come together to create a form um, requires Witten to be able to do that work um, over time. And that yeah. the durational element of it is something that, you know, is phenomenal, but it's felt, right? You can really feel the labor in them and the tactility too. Yeah. No, I, it's like, um, well, I, I was, I was really trying to understand, you know, also how to, how to get at how to how to understand the, the use of certain terms you know that are that are so crucial for uh for a certain kind of christian mysticism especially in in his in his work and and, and the one term that, that kept coming back partly because of particularly that piece called totem totem 2000 number six which is dedicated to Coltrane, but the term is Annunciation, um, you know, which in, in sort of Christian mystical history is the, the moment when the, when the Holy Spirit descends and informs Mary that she is blessed of all women <laughs> because she will, um, uh, will bear, you know, the, the, the son. Right. And I, and I kept thinking, what, what's this? What's I wonder what the what the significance of that term is for 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 Whitten. And, and of course, what's interesting is that there's a series of paintings. This is from 2000, um, and and he writes about it in the woodshed notes. Um, but then there was another set of paintings that he was doing at the turn, you know, 1979. Um, another piece called Annunciation, um, Annunciation 14. And, and in that piece, you know, I was, he, he was again, it's, it appears to be the case that he had been thinking this deep, deep, deep relation to train, to Coltrane, by way of this notion of Annunciation for a long, long time. Oh, um, I love that. Yeah, and I, I'm, I don't know what to say about it. I'm just interested in it, you know. I know. Like I'm, I, I'm I, to... I, I love that you're bringing up Coltrane, though, because Fred, like, it, it is sound, right? That that is something that you know, I almost feel like is a part of this that we can keep. We could keep unpacking infinitely, um, yeah. and there's so much. I think you know, as I look at that these works that that does the work of speaking, right? Um, but also of of making sound, right? Of making music. Yeah. Well. He, he, there's a beautiful essay in the, that great kind of priceless 
small catalog that the Studio Museum did for that show there by, I hope I'm getting Henry Geltzahler. And mm -hmm. Geltzahler quotes Witten, Witten says, because Witten's talking about train, and he says, um, the sound you hear in his music comes at you in waves. He catches it when it comes by, and he'll grab at as much of it as he needs or, uh, or can grasp. I think that in plastic terms, translating from sound, I was sensing sheets, waves of light, a sheet of light passing. That's how I was seeing light. That's why I refer to these paintings as energy fields. And you know, a whole lot of critics were, well, there's two sort of common places in, in, in jazz criticism, and particularly in criticism of Train, that, that I think he's working with and indexing there. And one is that the formulation that, that some of what Train was doing, particularly after 1965, um, was, was that one term for it was energy music, that, that Train was dealing in these energy fields as well. But also, um, but also that, that formulation that the critic Ira Gittler makes about Coltrane, where he says, Coltrane is playing sheets of sound. Right. And, and, and I begin to think, well, maybe what it is that Witten takes from that is this notion of a kind of sheets of paint, mm. right? That he begins to think about the paint as fabric. And that as much as he's a, again, and that's part of why we might want to call him a fabricator on a literal yes, sense. Right. He's thinking about the paint as fabric and, and, his, and his, his tools, his utensils are not really so much the brush anymore, but, but the blade, right? Mm -hmm. He's cutting this fabric. He becomes a seamstress in, in a certain kind I'm of way. I'm there with you. That cutting, right. And that also that kind of, um, it's a splice. Right, it's slicing yeah. and cutting, and then it's there's a stitch there too, which I think is like a really great place as you know, kind of reconciling with this question of almost a fissure. Yep, a glitchy kind of stitching too, mm -hmm. right? Because right. it produces that kind of weird, you know, tessellated, pixelated effect that that Deeply. we get, you know, and um and and so you look, and then you have to look again, and it produces this glint and this shimmer and this kind of shiny kind of thing in a way that almost makes it feel like what he's doing is, is, is sequence, you know, um, that, that, he's a, that he's, a, he's a seamstress who works or a designer who works with sequence, you know, which I know you know runs in the family. Right, me. right. And someone is saying in the chat right now, right, that, you know, dad was a coal miner, mom was a seamstress, right? So this stitching was something that was innate, right? But also like this yeah. sort of presence of the industry, right? That industry and a, as a kind of fabrication, as a sort of machinery, and also marking him really as a technologist too, um, yeah. running alongside everything else. When you think, Fred, about, you know, what this could be as fabric, right? I'm seeing that, you know, that this could be printed, you know, in terms of almost uh, a kind of data score and so yeah. there is something there too that you know could read as a, as a sheet music right as a kind of composition um, that could be played and that these perhaps are also these different notes that the tesserae give us almost keys to put our fingers on and that actually for me sitting in front of it is like the tempting thing too right like that's why this two two-dimensional plane is a complicated thing to navigate because you really want to step into it you want to come into contact with the work it's holographic you know, but, but it's, and it's cool because, um, but the other thing that I, I know you know is, you know, in addition to his mom and dad, his brother is a really renowned designer named Bill Frank Whitney. Right, exactly. Who, uh, was a renowned designer of shirts and, and, and particularly, you know, for musicians. But, but I guess his most famous piece was, was, was Michael Jackson's sequined glove. Love. I know, which else I, I have to say, you know, thinking about when you were talking about kind of the glint within this work, right? I mean, it, it, there is something too there that is this um, kind of language of dazzling, right? That like, how do you take something that actually is an ordinary material, right? Like yeah. a glove, how do you take something that, you know, is, is something like, you know, like in the in tesserae case, almost operating as, as a brick, right? As a brick layer towards a structure, that there is something there that is, you know, very straightforward, right? But then every piece of this is its own work. 
Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, within that too, right, there is this kind of incredible opening of each of these pieces because, you know, each piece of it is a canvas. Well, it, it, it reminds me of, uh, you know, a famous phrase uh, in Zora Neale Hurston's essay, Characteristics of Negro Expression, which the will to adorn. And of course, that's also the title that Cheryl Wall, a great literary critic, took for her last book, you know. But but clearly, you know, Witten is imbued, you know, with the will to adorn. And and to adorn is is also to adore, you know. I mean, it, mm. it's it's work of of love. Um and, and, and love and devotion. Yeah. 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 I I love, I appreciate Fred you saying devotion. Absolutely, yeah, because I think like you know, to do that work is, is deep work. It's something that yeah. is specific, right? It's, it is, it's, you know, it's planned. Yeah. Um, and done so, you know, in a way that really is quite deliberate and thoughtful. And so within that, I also, you know, see so much within each of these pieces that, you know, Witten really is helping us think differently about sort of what it is to create these works, right? And have them be, be both whole and deeply abstracted. Um, that there is, you know, a drive there that is so specific and a language that he's kind of working towards and helping us maybe define and redefine. But I noticed too that there were folks in the chat that kind of were noting about, you know, some of the titles of the work, um, you know, coming up to uh, Mask Three for the Children of Dunblane, Scotland, um, yeah. you know, and and the relationship, you know, that I, as I kind of spent time with that work, which is an incredibly important work, um, you know, alongside of the work of 20th April, 1999, number one, right? And whereas one, um, noting in 1986, right, these are uh, pupils and a teacher who, um, you know, were murdered in the deadliest shooting in British history. And that yeah. that, within that context, really established um, the gun laws within the UK. Um, and then, you know, kind of conversely, almost, you know, within this kind of discussion and dialogue, we're seeing in the same space as we're kind of walking through the gallery, um, this work, which of course, um, you know, features the two protagonists of the Columbine shooting. Um, yeah. And so there is this kind of um, complicated dynamic, right, you know, in terms of this question of the work as they, you know, what was intended to be seen, right, we're in the woodshed, these works as they have been kind of unscrolled as we're reading them, because as well, too, there's, you know, kind of commentary, there's media deeply embedded in this. Um, and mm -hmm. there's kind of a, a response and kind of a broadcast too in responding to a kind of global awareness as someone who is deeply embedded within an America, but as well aware of what is taking place around him in the world. Yeah, no, there's, there's information. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there's, you know, very, very, famous celebrated formulation that the poet William Carlos Williams makes, you know, about the news being in poetry, you know, um, and, and, you know, and poets love that because, you know, poets love to think that, that they're doing something special <laughs> and unique, but, but, but there's, but the news is in these, these, these paintings too, um, there. And it's cool, right? I mean, it makes you want to, get all, you know, uh, highfalutin about it in a way, but, but maybe the, the paintings that, that we keep, that we remain invested in are the ones that keep, 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 keep telling the news, right? Mm. That keep bringing the news, you know, and it's, you know, it's the good news, you know, it's, it's, it's a gospel of a certain sort, but it's also the bad news too, you know, and it's, it's all the shit, you know, all right. the, all the all the brutality, um, you know, that's that's what's that's what's here, and um, he he writes it out for us, you know. Mm -hmm. um, he, he makes he, it known. He gives it, you know. He I think that this is where there are these different layers of you know a sort of legibility, right? Like moments where he's letting us read something head on and with clarity, right? And moments where he actually is really requiring us to do a different type of work. In, in kind of decoding it and being in conversation really too with him, allowing him to kind of talk to us and then for us to talk back to him. I'm seeing in the chat, um, you know, as we're kind of moving into the Q&A uh, part of this, um, 
uh, a comment uh, about you know someone who um, ran into Jim Barton, who was a studio assistant of Jack's, and they're talking about the way in which he worked, which you know of course feels significant here. That you know there was a moment where Jack Witten let go of the brush altogether, um, and so the comment is is remarking about you know him pouring acrylic paint in pools on the floor, the ways in which you know he would kind of move with the work, and you know I think that that in itself too is something that is remarkable and exciting to think about because as well it helps us understand that you know even though the material itself the paint is dry right um that actually the intention of the work began with gesture um and yeah. a deeply studied dynamism too yeah 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 no they, that kind of that choreography um it's a <laughs> it's more on the ground you know i right. guess i was you know the, you know the, the the sort of famous dance that that produced you know Pollock's lines. You know, and his 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 images are, you know, it was it was vertical in a certain kind of way, um, and the, you know, and what was happening was happening from above, you know, and 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 from a certain kind of movement that was, in some ways, you know felt to me always like it was separated, you know, from the ground. None of that is meant to denigrate it or to to lessen the, the impact of it at all. But but this is a grounded thing, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so it makes you, you know, and again it, it may it's there's a there's this question of tilling and digging, <laughs> you know, in uh yeah. his in his work. Um and in Witten's work and and uh and grounding, you know, in maybe like in that Walter Rodney kind of sense, rooting as Otto Ribeiro says, you know, yeah, mm -hmm. that's, that's it's a it's a well, it's just beautiful work. I mean, it's just it's amazing. It's beautiful to be able to to see it. I feel sad, you know, that. All this, this show happens moment when we can't, you know, where it's difficult for people to be present, you know, with that work, because um, right. the work encourages that presencing, as as you said, you mm -hmm. know, and uh, I, I hope I hope, you know, I hope we'll get a chance to be there with it, um, not just to look at it, but to look with it, you know, um, someday soon. Yeah, I mean, the, the question of convening around the work um, is one yeah. that, you know, I keep coming back to. And I know that in a different iteration, a different tear in space and time, right, that we would be there standing with these works and be able to spend some time with them, um, you know, intimately and physically. Um, but, you know, I will say, like, Witten was before his time in so many ways. And so for me, it, it is remarkable to be having this conversation about, you know, all that he was kind of putting together, thinking through, um, especially right now, because so much was very prescient to this moment, um, to this week even, right? Um, kind of thinking through ways where abstraction and gesture um, and sound and space can do different types of work of kind of enclosing, protecting, um, you know, creating space, right? To, to do uh, a different type of thinking in, in public and also in private. So almost it feels unique and apt to be having these conversations in the privacy of our homes um, and then still in this public, right? <laughs> Which is with all of these incredible folks who are here today. Um, so I, I thank you, Brad, because you know it's super special to be able to take the time to just sit and just vibe a little bit. Um, and you know, I couldn't think of a better uh, you know, combination of folks that you know, an afternoon with Jack Witten and with you. I appreciate being with you too. This is good. This is, you know, as you say, he he calls a, you know, the altar pieces call us to the altar. <laughs> you know, I mean, and to call us to 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 a kind of gathering, um, and it's really important because, as you say, on the one hand, we've always had to gather under constraint. We've always had to figure out a way to gather when gathering was interdicted 
Mm. And now it's predicted like never before. And at the same time, what we see is these brutal, vicious degradations of gathering, mm -hmm. you know, the form of, you know, you know, Druid, Viking, fascist, you know, sort of, you know, political. <laughs> druid, hella Druid. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but, but I think that, uh, you know, we still have to, we still have to figure out how to get together. And there's, mm -hmm. uh, and there's nothing better than, than, than being able to get together around his work. And it was really fun and cool to be able to get together with you. So thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. And thank you all for joining us. I mean, Fred, I could seriously be on the line for you with another six hours of time. So we're gonna have to do some kind of part two, part three. Um, but this afternoon has been a treat. Um, and please, of course, keep the conversation going. My hope is that for those of you who can see the show and are comfortable doing so that you'll brave the streets and get out there to see it before it closes. But for those of you, of course, who are at home or working remotely, um, there's so much online that you can kind of continue to come back to. Beautiful images of Jack Whitten's work and essays and such that continue to be um, really inspirational along with interviews. So I encourage you to check those out as well. Have an incredible afternoon and thank you, Fred. Thank you. Thank Talk you. Soon.